Good morning, church family. Let's stand together. We're so glad that you're here. You made it safely. Before we start, I just want to take a second to thank all the volunteers and trustees, our plow team, that helped us to be able to have services this morning. And um, just heartfelt thanks from all of us for taking the extra time to do that. And isn't it awesome to have a boiler now that works and it's new? Uh, on a cold day like this, it's great to be in here uh, together to worship. So we are in this sermon series called Spiritual Drowsiness. We talked a little bit last week about how a lot of us are just sleepwalking through life, not really aware of what the Lord's doing or what he's asking us to do. And so um, last week Kevin was preaching and he talked about the theme verse for this series being Ephesians 5. Uh, that says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And so this is our prayer for all of us, that we can wake up from our spiritual slumber and uh, be ready to be used by the Lord. And so last week when, when Kevin was preaching, I just kept thinking about that verse, thinking about that verse, that a little melody came to mind. So we're going to sing a song that, that leads us into Awake My Soul that we also sang last week. But um, this is the theme song, and this is the theme scripture for this series. Now, if you're like me, I'm a horrible memorizer, unless you can put it to music. So I'm sure if you're driving down the road and you listen to a radio that, that you, you haven't heard the song like 40 years, 30 years, whatever, the words come right back. Isn't it amazing how our brains work? And so for me, when I really want to memorize a scripture, I try to put it to uh, to music. So that's what we did with this song here. It's going to help us memorize our theme verse. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we're going to teach it to you here. It goes like this. We're going to start just singing Wake Up together just to get us awake. Sing this down. Wake up. Wake up, 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 oh, wake up, oh, sleeper, rise from the dead, Christ will shine on you. Bring 
Breathe on me, breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me, breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me. I want to wake up, I want to come alive. I come alive, I'm alive when you breathe on me. I come alive, I'm alive when you breathe on me. So come on, my soul, awake. Awake, 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 my soul. So here's the test. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Rise from the... Yes. And Christ will shine on you. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Rise from the dead. And Christ will... All right, we'll get it. Every week we're going to keep singing that little song to help, it, uh, help us to hide God's word in our heart. It's one of my favorite scripture verses is to hide God's word in our heart. To hear the word of God, the truth of God's word. Hide it in our heart so that when we need it most, we're reminded by the Holy Spirit to bring forth that scripture and apply it to our life. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, the way the Lord works with us um, day by day. And so um, we don't often do like two newer songs in one day, but we're going to do it today because it's special. Y'all made it here through the wilderness and the cold. And so um, this is our theme song for 2024. This is called The Jesus Way. And um, we talked a little bit last week about um, we're really focusing as a church to practice the way of Jesus, to learn how Jesus lived his life, how he showed us how to live our lives and to actually do it. And so the second I heard this song, when it came out a couple months ago, I said, you know what, I love that song. I really feel like we need to sing it as a church. And, um, and I know now is the time because 2024, this is our commitment, is to follow in the way of Jesus, to live like he lived, to love like he loved. And that's what this song is all about. So we're going to teach you the chorus first. 
Um, it says, I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. So this is our proclamation, our dedication to the Lord, even as we sing this song together. So let's sing. It goes like this. I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. The rest goes like this. If you bless me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will You're helpless. If you're helpless, I will defend you. If you're burdened, I'll share the weight. If you're hopeless, then let me show you. There's hope in the Jesus way. There's the chorus now. And I follow Jesus.
we choose to worship you no matter what's going on in our life, the good times, the bad. You modeled that for us, Jesus. We choose the Jesus way. We praise you, Lord. You're worthy of our praise. We're in awe and wonder of your greatness and your goodness today. Thank you, Jesus. We humbly surrender ourselves before you so that we can lift you up. Oh, praise. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord. Our One more time we sing, oh praise and oh so good to praise you, Jesus. So good to lift your name on high. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, wash over our hearts as we open your word. Lord, teach us your truth so that we can hide it in our hearts, so that as we go through every moment of every day, we hear your voice speaking to us. We choose the Jesus way, Lord. You modeled that. You knew scripture so well. You quoted it all the time. You constantly surrendered your heart to the Father's heart. You constantly sought him in prayer. Lord, we want to be like you. We choose to be like Jesus. One more time we sing, oh, praise. Lift it up here, church. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Forevermore, for endless days, we will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Amen. Thank you, church. You can have a seat. Good morning. It's good to be with you. If you have your Bibles, would you please open them to Ephesians chapter 4? We'll be spending most of our time in verses 17 through 24. And as you're turning there, let me just be very honest with you that the last month of studying this text, this passage has really convicted me. And I imagine it will do the same to you. So might as well prepare your hearts now. Last week, we, we studied Ephesians uh, 4, 1 through 16, as we kicked off our new series called Spiritual Drowsiness. And really what that means is that we can often find ourselves in a state of apathy or complacency when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. And really, at the heart of it, it's a condition where our passion for God and our spiritual life become dull, and we kind of lose sight of the joy of what it means to follow after him. And so we are diving into the book of Ephesians to understand what it looks like to overcome this state of drowsiness because Paul is writing to a group of believers who are struggling with this issue. You won't see the word spiritual drowsiness in this text, but I'm telling you that's what they were dealing with. And last week, we begin, uh, Paul begins the application section of the book of Ephesians. Now, if you dove into this book, the first three chapters are all about the gospel, what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. And then the last three chapters are all about uh, what it looks like to follow after him. So he encourages readers 
towards sanctification, which if you don't know what that is, that's a fancy word for the process of making us holy and becoming more like Christ. So Paul is instructing them to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And then in the rest of this letter, Paul gives great detail about that worthy walk. He doesn't just say it, but he gives great details, which at the heart of that displays the unity of the believers in Christ. In Ephesians 1 through 10, Paul reminds the church of their common faith and of their individual giftedness. Along the same lines, in 11 through 16, Paul writes that God has gifted the church with leaders who will work to equip the believers and to edify the body of Christ. Paul taught that God has gifted the church with people whose task it is to aid believers in their sanctification. So, in other words, what did we learn last week? We learned that we, what we can do to help maintain our unity in the church. He ended that section by speaking about how we can grow into maturity and the proper working of the church. And then he also pointed out that the way we live matters to unity, which goes right into 17 through 24. And what we're going over this morning challenges us, believers, to put off the old self that once walked in sin and darkness, and then to put on the new self by renewing our minds and walking with Christ. Because most of the believers are struggling with this issue of, of going back to this old life. That's the context of what we're about to look at this morning in the pastors. That's the overview of what we're about to get into. And you know, since you've come to faith in Jesus, I'm sure there have been times in your life where you've gone back to the old life. I mean, the way you used to live before you came, became a Christian. And perhaps there are moments in your life where it feels like you're doing well spiritually and you're kind of going along and doing your thing and it seems like, man, everything's going well. But then you get around maybe your old friends and it sort of sucks you back into the old things that you're doing. And you just kind of go along with the flow and do whatever they are doing. And yet you know that's probably not what God wants you to do. You ever done that? I know it's a very personal kind of question to ask, especially to kick off uh, this message, but the reason why I even bothered to ask that is so many believers seem to struggle with this issue. Being a Christian is sort of God pulling us out of the world, yet I have to live in this world, and I'm still surrounded by worldly people, so how do I do that? So many people struggle with it. And in fact, Paul did, primary writer of the New Testament, probably the most well-known person outside of Jesus in Christianity, he did. Keep your place uh, in Ephesians 4, and if you, if you would, here's my challenge to you this morning. We're going to be turning our Bibles a lot this morning. I would love for you to look at your Bible and not at the screen up here. I'll give you time. Go turn over to Romans chapter 7. You're not going to always have this big screen and pro presenter at home, so I want you to get used to turning to the Scripture so you know where, where things are at. Romans chapter 7, look at verse 15. I'll give you a few seconds. And if you're an underliner, these are great passages to underline. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, Paul writes, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. That's a tongue twister right there, isn't it? You ever been like that? You ever get to the place where you go, you know what, I don't want to live this life anymore, this, this lifestyle anymore, and yet I feel like I keep kind of falling back into it, or I get with the wrong group of people, and I start living like this all over again. The desire to do right but then I keep failing. I keep doing the thing I hate to do, as Paul mentions. That's the passage that we're about to look at this morning. It's all about change and our need to change. But better yet, God's plan for us to change, the how to change. Now, there's really two important things I want you to know before we actually jump into the passage in Ephesians. One of them is this. Change is not easy. It's not easy because our enemy hasn't changed. Revelation chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, tells us that the Satan is the accuser of the brethren, that he's out there attacking and accusing all the time. And we know that the world system, the very system that you and I got saved out of and are supposed to be different than, still exists. We still live and work in the middle of it. And you and I, we still have flesh. Change is not easy. But you know what? The second thing is this I want you to know is that it's totally possible. It is totally possible because God has given us all the power that you and I need to live differently. Again, keep your place in Ephesians, but go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you look at verse 17. Paul writes here and he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. 
God has done this supernatural change in my life that when I come to faith, it allows me to be different. I'm not like who I was before. Now, let me tell you why that's really important. There's this old saying, first servers got it. I don't know if you will, but we'll see if you do. There's an old saying that you may have heard before, and it goes something like this. Dead fish float downstream, but it takes a live one to, to, to swim upstream. Any dead fish can go along with society, the current of life, doing what everyone else is doing. You can just do what everyone else is doing, but it takes life. It takes life to go against that current, right? Go back over to Ephesians for a second, but before we go to chapter 4, look at chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verses 4 and 5. Paul says this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Let me translate that for you. God made you alive. You don't have to go along with the flow any longer. You don't have to be that dead fish going along with the current of life. God made you alive. You can't go along with it and just say, oh, I couldn't help it. Everybody was doing it. You don't have to do that. And if you look around Ephesians 113, 130, and 430, it tells us that God has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. Meaning, he has given us the power and the ability to change. And yet, that doesn't change the fact that it's a difficult task because there's a battle that is raging in our lives. There's one more passage I want us to look at before we go through 17 through 24. If you look at Galatians 5 and look at verses 16 and 17, Paul says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit... And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. There's a battle that is raging on in your life. God has put this spirit inside of you and you're, and you're living in this world and this world is battling and calling to you and trying to live you a certain way. And God, and yet he's trying to give you to live a certain way. And it makes us that we feel, we feel like we're pulled back and forth all the time. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because some, maybe all of the Ephesian believers are, are struggling with that very issue being pulled back and forth, going back through their old life, the life they used to lead before they became to Christ. That's the context of the passage that we're looking at this morning. I wanted to set the foundation of what Paul is going to be talking about. And so what I want us to do, I want to read 17 through 24. We're going to read all the passages, and then we're going to take our time and go through verse by verse. So let's, let's start in verse 17. It says this. So I tell you, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, and the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because some of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. So now what Paul's going to do here this morning, he's going to tell you why you should not go back to the old life, and then the how you should not go back to the old life. When I'm studying the scriptures, I like to break it up a little bit. So 17 through 21 is that why part, and then 22 through 24 is that how part. And that's what we're going to go through right now. So let's start in verse 17. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do and the futility of their thinking. Okay, so he says, stop acting like Gentiles. Here's the problem. They are Gentiles. So what's he saying to them? Stop being you? No, he's not saying that. Stop being the old you. Stop acting like you used to live like the person you were before you found Christ. And I love this quote from John Eldridge. There's, there's a book called Waking the Dead. And he says this, We have to choose to live from the new heart, and our old nature doesn't go down without a fight. That is so good. Because that's what we constantly deal with. Stop acting like the old life. In fact, in a minute, we're going to read in verse 18 through 19, he refers to their old life as they, past tense. Now, what Paul does is that he sort of starts into the reasons now for why you shouldn't go back into the old life, and he actually uses a word to sort of preface the whole thought. It's the word futility. And the word basically means worthless. 
That's his overall description of what it means to go back. And he begins to describe it. And really, he's going to use five descriptions uh, to, to, to describe this old life. And the first one that we see is that he says it's dark. Look at verse 18. He says, they are darkened in their understanding. Darkened in their understanding. Dark. I mean, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb here to imply that a, a, a thought life isn't good. It's evil. Our, that our thoughts are sinister. And you know, if we're honest about things, we're probably afraid of the dark mostly. It's not something that we want to be in all the time. And the dark is really the opposite of who we're supposed to be as Christians. I mean, God has called us to be children of light in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said you're supposed to be lights to the world. We're not supposed to be dark, yet it's easy to get lost in the dark. Have you noticed that? We live in a dark, fallen Genesis 3 world that's full of temptation. And it's really easy to give into that temptation and get lost in the dark. But then he keeps going in verse 18, and he talks about the fact that we become hardened. He says, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So when we go back to the old life, there's a hardness of heart. And you know that a hard-hearted person at some point just stopped caring about what God wants. They sort of lose interest in doing it his way. I'm sure you're all familiar with the term Tenderhearted. Many of us know uh, people that are very tenderhearted that basically just kind of weep at everything and they find joy in everything. That's Lee. He cries all the time in the office. He's always smiling. I don't understand it. But tenderhearted people. Most of you know that I didn't grow up in a very safe home. I didn't. I grew up in a very drug, violent, infested home. And so there's a church family that kind of adopted me when I was 20 years old. Doug and Lori Miller are their names. Funny that their last names are the same as mine. I had no idea what it looks like to live in a safe home. I had no idea what it looks like to have a Christian family. And they knew that. And they adopted me. They brought me in. They are the definition of tenderhearted people. Hard-hearted would be just the opposite. They're not moved by any injustice or, or wrong or, or wound or injury that, or something that's sweet. They don't care about those things. The reality is they don't care about others. They only care about themselves. Paul keeps going here in verse 19. And he says that they become insensitive, but I actually like what other versions use here, and that's the word callous. One of my favorite things about weightlifting is the fact that you start to grow calluses on your hands. It's a painful journey, but when it, when it arrives, it's awesome. You can grip the weights easier, and I found having rough hands helps me do other things easier around the house. But I remember how badly they hit when they first came in. Callus is just rough. I mean, we've all had times in our lives where you overworked your hands. I'm sure many of you this morning... If you're scraping off ice in your, on your car, you probably couldn't feel your hands after 30 seconds if you weren't wearing gloves. That was me at 630 this morning. Couldn't feel my hands. It was insensitive. A calloused, insensitive heart that doesn't feel anything isn't a good thing. He keeps going to verse 19, and he says that uh, not only their hardness of heart, but he said they become calloused, and they've given themselves up to sensuality. There's a biblical word for that, depraved. Paul uses these exact words for those who give themselves up to sensuality. He would use these exact words in Romans chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. For, but for people who get to the point where they totally reject and ignore God and just choose to pursue their own desires instead of pursuing God. They begin to pursue sexual sin. And you know what happens? That They end up living these lives that totally lack concern for their consequences of their action. And then he takes it a step further. Because it's not that they just stop pursuing God and start pursuing these things, but they become so consumed with it because now they'll say they become greedy to the practice of every kind of impurity. They can't get enough of it. In other words, they're only interested in pleasing themselves and they seem to be constantly pursuing some sort of satisfaction. And yet that satisfaction doesn't meet their needs. And so they keep going and going and going and going until they're like, is something going to fill this desire? They keep sinning to find a sin that's going to fill that desire and it doesn't work. No real love for others in this person. This person is a user. And just to be honest with you, isn't this exactly the mindset of a person who's looking for a one-night stand? Isn't that what they are? I mean, they're not interested in being with somebody else and loving and having this new wonderful situation. They just want to fulfill a desire and have that moment and to just see you, move on. Paul wanted the Ephesians, and he wants us to know that it's not okay to look to live like that. Look at what he says in verse 20. Here's a, here's, here's a response to that. He says, 
That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ. The way you learned or heard about Christ here would be the same thing, the exact same thing as what you believed. So what did you believe when you came to faith in Jesus? Can you remember? Maybe it was a month ago, a few years ago, decades ago. I remember when I was 16 years old, my father at that time died of a drug overdose. And with some weird turn of events, I started attending a youth group down the road. And not too long after I was attending that youth group, someone paid for me to attend a church camp called Student Life that was hosted at Cedarville University. I was not excited about that at all, by the way. I was like, church camp, I don't want to be a part of that. I had no idea what that was. But I went anyways because my buddy told me there would be cute girls there. So I tried it. I said, all right. I'll give it a shot. But then something profound happened to me. I remember the gospel became very, very clear to me. I knew I was a sinner and I was in need of a savior. I I remember living this terrifying, exhausting life of of witnessing drug deals, shootings, uh, my mom and dad beating each other. All these things I was witnessing. I was like, I want to get out of that life. And I feel like the only way to get out of that life is God. And little did I know, a few years later, after I gave my life to Christ, he would call me to full-time ministry. Being the moron that I am, I didn't submit to it right away, but eventually I did. And here we are. I just felt this overwhelming sense of purpose and love. I mean, compared to God who is perfect, I am so far from perfect. I've had bad thoughts. I've, I've done the wrong thing time and time again. I have, I've had anger issues and, and lust issues. You name it. I've, I've done everything. I'm a sinner. I fall short of the glory of God. I also learned that I'm incapable of saving my own self. I can't do it. I can't be good enough. I can't do good enough things to earn salvation. Nothing changes the fact that who I fundamentally am in my nature is a sinner. I can't work my way to heaven. But man, I also learned that Jesus loved me enough to go to the cross and suffer and die for sins that he did not commit. Those are my sins that put him on the cross. I learned that they took him off the cross and and, and put him in the grave. But three days later, he came out of that grave, that he has power over life and death, his victory over the grave, and his victory is my victory. And so I learned what I need to do. I needed to stop and acknowledge my sin. God, I am a sinner. I need to trust him and that he would forgive me and he would give me new life. And in the middle of that new life, in this lifetime now, he had given me a sense of purpose, a reason to be here. That's what I learned when when I came and trusted in Jesus. Now, let me tell you what I didn't learn. And I think what Paul is getting at here. I didn't learn, hey, go pray this prayer and then just go live your life. I didn't learn that. Because part of the process is when we begin to trust in Christ, we begin to follow after him and look like him. You just don't, he doesn't die on the cross for you to just live however you want. Let me show you something. I love how the scripture compliments one another. Keep, keep your spot in Ephesians and go over to the right in Colossians chapter 2 and look at verses 6 and 7. If you don't want to turn, they'll be on the screen. Even though I would like for you to turn. Verse 6 says, So then, Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. This is what we're expected to do. This is Paul's expectation for us. Now, if you look at Ephesians 4, back to our main text, and look at verse 20, and really verse 21, Paul sort of changed, going to sort of change in the second part. He says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. So what Paul is telling the Ephesians here is, is, now look, you're not supposed to live like that, but maybe you don't believe. Maybe, maybe you need to examine yourself. Maybe you don't believe. Maybe you need to make sure that you're in the faith. And you know what? Paul actually says that before. That's not the first time he said this. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. He's saying, look, you ought to be able to know. You ought to be sure. There should be a sense of conviction and sin over sin in your life. If you come to faith in Jesus and you have no, no conviction over the sin in your life, that's a major red flag. Now, I want you to remember something here, that Paul is not writing to the people in the city of Ephesus. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus because it was people within the church who said, yes, I have come to believe in Jesus. Yes, I have trusted in Jesus that we're going out and doing these things they used to do beforehand, living that old life. 
So he's writing to them and calling them out of that. I got a really old term for you this morning. The first service, I'm not sure if you will. Old term for you, and some of you may know, it's, it's backslidden. And really, it's a term that used to be used by people who used to be Christians, but had gone back to their old ways, their old lifestyle, and simply aren't living a Christian life anymore. And I'm not talking about just, just blowing it and making a bad choice. I'm talking about a lifestyle, a deliberate lifestyle that we choose to ignore and walk away and want nothing to do with God. That's what this group was doing. So what do you do about that? Well, you get to this point, and now this is where Paul is going to shift gears, and he's going to tell us how we change, right? So he started off telling us why we should change, because of how dark this was, the hardening of hearts. It's not who we're supposed to be. If we come to faith in Jesus, we should be different now, but he's going to tell us how. So follow along with me as I read in verse 22. And we'll end in just a minute. He says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul's going to suggest here that there's three changes that need to be made. Now change number one, he starts off in verse 22, and it says that you need to put off the old self. Translated, stop doing the things you used to do. Again, this is a battle for every believer. If you, if you look at Colossians 3, 5 through 9, Paul says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but you also must rid yourselves of all these things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with these practices. In other words, it's time for you to change, to be different. You know, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I love this. As we're going around from verse to verse and reading these different passages, have you noticed that Paul, he wrote to the people in Galatia, so he wrote to the Galatians. We're reading, he wrote to the people in Ephesus, so he wrote to the people, in, he wrote to the Ephesians. He wrote to the people in Colossae, so the Colossians. You know what that tells me, right? Everybody struggles with this. We struggle with this. It's not just one group of people. It's not just one church. It's the capital C church. Going back to the old life. So how do we change? You go to verse 22 because we'll even tell you that, that the old life is kind of wooing and it, and it deceives us. And Jesus keeps calling us back like it's a comfortable thing for us to be. Look at verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. It lies to you. Just come hang, hang out with us and do what you've always done. Come on. It lies to you. It's easy to sin. It's, it's way easier to sin than to follow Jesus sometimes. It just is. Now get to the second change here. First change is, you know, you got to stop doing the old things, put off your old self. Change number two, though, is that you have to change what you put into your minds. Look at verse 23, and it says, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Or other translations, which I really enjoy, to renew the spirit in your minds. To, re to be renewed is to fill your mind with the truth. Why is that a big deal? Well, have you ever heard of the term garbage in, garbage out? Garbage in, garbage out is this idea that whatever you put inside of you is going to come out and it's going to affect things in your life. Let me tell you why that's a big deal. God, when he designed your brain, made something incredibly special. Our brains are like these super powerful biochemical computers that download tons of information every single day. Everything you see Hear, touch, taste, read, everything goes into that computer called a brain. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because every single time your brain then calls for a decision to be made about something, all that information that's been downloaded inside your brain has a staining effect on every single issue you deal with. It will put its mark on it. The TV shows, the movies, any, everything you put inside of your brain has a staining effect on, your, on you. So you need to ask yourself, is it God honoring? Is it, gonna, is, it gonna, is it gonna make me stumble? It's probably gonna have some kind of effect on you if you're not careful. And man, how can I not mention this if we're talking about this? Pornography. It has an incredibly staining effect on you. It's degrading, it's abusive, it's lustful, it's dark in its nature. It cannot possibly make it possible for you to look at a sister in Christ and have good thoughts. We have to be proactive about the things that we put into our minds. 
And it starts by that first change. You've got to stop. You've got to put off the things that you were doing. And then it gets to this point in saying you've got to feed your minds with things that are going to build you up the right way. You don't have to turn there, but Romans chapter 12, Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Basically saying, quit giving in. Just, just stop doing that. Do not be conformed any longer. But then he tells you how. He says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the only way to do it. You can be transformed by the things that go into your mind. That is a promise. You want an example? I'm, I'm glad you asked. Look at Psalm 119 on the screen here. Here's the promise, that if I hide God's word, it will have an amazing effect on my life. He says in verse 9, how can a young person stay on, the earth of pure, stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray away from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, I need to stay in this, God. I get it. If I don't stay in the word, I'll begin to stumble. And then verse 11 hits. You see the renewal there? It's not just stop doing this, but now if I start putting God's word in my heart, he gives me the capacity to have a renewed mind. To think differently, to see the world differently, to be set apart and see the world through the lens of Christ. And to keep me from sin. So Paul has told us here that he said, you know, stop doing these things. And now he's telling us you need to fill your mind with the truth. By the way, isn't it really easy to say stop? In fact, most... Most of the people I know that struggle with certain things will say, you know, I've stopped 20 times. I've stopped looking at poor like 30 times. Well, here's the problem. You left a void there, though you just stopped. You have to fill that with something, with something good, with something true, with honorable. If you don't fill that void, you're going to keep sinning and sinning like we mentioned earlier. You have to learn how to fill it with the right things to renew your mind. Stopping is one thing. We need to fill that with something else. Otherwise, it's going to be an endless cycle of victory and defeat. But then, but then he gets to change number three, and that is do what God has called you to do. You go back to verse 24 in Ephesians 4. He says, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, it will be on the screens. We're running out of time here. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, Paul writes, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. In other words, start doing what God wants you to do. And what does that look like? I, I think the best place for us to, do, to start is Galatians chapter 5. If you look at verses 22 and 23, it's a great place to start. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You want to know the answer, you do those things. Stop doing the things that you're doing. Stop living by the flesh in the old world. Start filling your mind up with the things that are honorable and true and right and good that will build you up. The things that are excellent and start doing the things that God is asking you to do. Love people, encourage them, be kind, be tender, serve in your church. Allow God to use you that way. And by the way, if you look at the end of verse 24, it will tell you that we can even get sort of a gauge and a measure on the whole thing. Because we know when we're doing this thing right, we're going to start looking a little bit more like Christ. Verse 24, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's how we're going to start looking. Let me, let me do this. Let me end with a bit of advice or, or a challenge, if you will. GMC, you have to put off the old before you can put on the new. Some of you are really struggling here because you're trying to wear both. I know that's the case. That was the case for me for a long time. I still struggle with that. You're trying to live in two worlds. You're trying to honor God in one way, but you really want to do the other way, and have your fun with all your friends and live a certain way, and it doesn't work like that. It will not work, and it never will. It will ultimately push you one way or the other, but it will not work. You can't be intimate with sin and intimate with Jesus because they go in opposite directions. So what do you do? Well, I imagine many of you probably got new winter coats this Christmas, which this was a, a fantastic morning to break that out. Do you put on the new coat over the old coat? No, that's silly. You throw away the old coat. You put on the new one. And some of you need to do that this morning. Very simple imagery. You need to take off the old life. You need to fill your mind up with the things of the Lord and start doing the things that God wants you to do by putting the new life on. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up and be done with it. The spiritual drowsiness needs to stop. And my hope and prayer is that you would be able to find your way off that cycle, the up and down, victory and defeat cycle, and get to the place where you can walk with the Lord joyfully. 
That will not happen as long as you're carrying around that old coat, that old self. You have to get rid of it. The former way of life, as Paul puts it. So you need to ask God to take it away. Christ did not save us in order that we may live any way that we choose. Our conduct, as Paul has indicated in verse 1 of chapter 4, as Kevin kicked off last week, is to conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of recalling in Christ. So let us become so saturated with God's word that we begin to reflect his ways, his values, his goals, his methods. That is the renewing of the mind of which Paul calls for. That's my challenge to you. That's how you practice the way of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray you would give us the desire to be away from those things and the wisdom to turn to your word. Fill our minds up with it, Father, with your wisdom, Lord, to help follow that up with actions of putting on the new self. Father, I pray that we can walk away this morning looking more like you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Michael. The word of God is powerful. It's living and active. And I'm so thankful for the way that Michael was honest and, and laid this all out before us. So we're sitting in worship planning, and, and I was like, we really need a closing song for this. And he said, you know what song we need is Death Was Arrested. I said, you, that is perfect. So church, let's stand together. We're going to sing this song um, because it talks about what we just learned. And as we sing, I ask that you are honest with Jesus and say, Lord, search my heart and allow the words of this song to really challenge you uh, and to take the next, next steps to be more like the Lord. My sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested in my life. Began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given. My morning grew quiet, my fever was When death was arrested, my life began. Come on, church, we sing. Know your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with me. It's your endless love. It's your endless love. Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my death and he called me. Thank you, Lord. That's when death was arrested in my life. Let's celebrate Jesus as we sing. Come on. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then, come on. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Oh, your grace so
so we can sing this with confidence, church. Come on, we're free by Jesus. We are free. So we can sing this too. Wake up, O oh sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's our theme we sing. Wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. One more time we sing. Wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper, and rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Amen, amen. Thank you, church. You can have a seat. So time for an elder update. We try to do this every three weeks. I'm Jack Clark. Uh, at this time... In the life of Grable Missionary Church, uh, when we're without a senior pastor, uh, in this season of renewal, I have a front row seat to see how God is working. I'm thrilled and humbled to experience the body of Christ in action, as each part does its part. You praying, we've called you to pray, the prayer guide here, we can feel your prayer. Uh, in service, in giving, when I think of service, I think of our staff. They've done an incredible job of leading the church, um, taking leadership in vision, and the new vision that we're going to be having on prayer. Just, they've done an excellent job. Uh, all the ministries have continued going forth and bearing fruit. There's been 35 baptisms since July. Um, many new people have stepped forward and said they wanted to become members. The pastoral search team, seven people doing an excellent job. They've narrowed a pool of over 30 people down to a handful. Uh, so continue to pray for our, personal, uh, our pastoral search team. Uh, three new elders are coming on board. I'm thrilled to look forward to working with them. Uh, working with the elders over this past year, uh, I can't, I just have such a love for them and the way God works through that. And then I get to the area of giving. Uh, I think of Acts 11:29 says, the believers, each according to his ability, sent their gifts to the elders. You know, we as elders made an appeal for the Boiler Up Fund. $320,000, I can't believe it, have come in toward our goal. Feel our heat. <laughs> you know, many of you have given sacrificially. Now you can feel the heat. Many of you have prayed. We can feel the Holy Spirit moving. Uh, God is at work at Grable Missionary Church, and our response as staff and elders is thank you. Thank you for praying Thank you for serving. Thank you for giving. God is at work at Grable Missionary Church and will continue to be at church. We look forward to see how God is going to work. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all of us can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. Now go and continue to be the church. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Before you leave, if you have a couple moments to help us tear the chairs down.